This episode of Vintage Stormfront Freaks has been previously recorded. Right on. We are thrilled to have with us uh, the Tornado Trackers, Gabe Cox, Jeff Mag- Mangum, and Jeremy Heyman. Am I saying that right, Jeremy Heyman? Nailed it. Right on. Nailed it. Right nice. on. Uh, so the Tornado Trackers were founded in May of 2013 when three friends created a joint Twitter account uh, to help keep friends and family updated on their chasing. Uh, since then, all three have been working together to maintain Tornado Trackers, both in field and and through social media. Uh, over, over the years, their footage has been broadcast on many networks, including ABC, NBC, CBS, The Weather Channel, CNN, and National Geographic. And they've also recently, and this is where we're going to start the questioning, guys. You guys just started out with Tornado Trackers podcast. And listen, I've had a chance to listen to a few episodes uh, really well produced, like so different than what I'm used to here at Stormfront Freaks. Um, like who? who Gee, thanks, I, thanks. Sorry, MJ, I didn't mean that. But guys, who, who's the who's the technical wizard behind putting this oh. thing together? Uh, Gabe Cox Gabe is Cox. our wizard. Yeah. Gabe, huh? All Gabe. All Gabe. Yeah, I, I really love the uh, the way you throw in the actual audio of a chase or a a scenario that you're, you know, the guest is talking about. Um, So give us some highlights from the first few episodes. Oh man. Highlights. I'm going to let Jeremy take that because he's ready to say something. (laughs) Well, I was going to say we started our, 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 the, the tiny little egg uh, was hatched on Stormfront Freaks years and years ago. Uh, where y'all so graciously let us blab for a little bit at the end of an episode. And um, that's where the idea started and, and, and where Jeff, Gabe and I were like, oh, I think we have something to talk about here. So um, yeah, the, the two episodes have been kind of iconic chases of ours that we talk about a lot. Um, Winnie Wood, Oklahoma, it, it, the, the EF4 there is, is a, is a great episode. We also kind of alternate every other episode. We, we, we usually have, um, another chaser or person in weather, um, on we've had Reed Timmer, Michael Binsky, Ginger Z, um, some really, some really great guests interviews, people who are really compelling. So that's kind of how, how we're, uh, I don't know, framing it right now is kind of some of our chases. Um, inside jokes, inside stories, and then uh, some other weather personalities too. Right on. Well, I, I, like I said, I've been really enjoying it. Uh, um, tell, tell us about uh, your, and let, let's go to Jeff on this, Jeff, because we were talking about it before we actually started broadcasting tonight. Tell us about uh, the the Mangum tornado and you calling the shot that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember what, what day was that? That was in 2019. Is it that was right? 2019, yeah. 2019. Yeah. And um, that was a high risk day. So that was a high risk tornado chase day. And so everyone was expecting tornadoes all over the place. And we were in uh, Mangum, Oklahoma that morning. I remember, and that's my name. So obviously I had to call that shot and say, there's going to be a tornado here. And sure enough, we ended up driving in some figure eights uh, across uh, Southern Oklahoma. And then we found ourselves back in Mangum, Oklahoma, where there was a, a pretty significant tornado there that day. And a lot of chasers. If yeah. anyone was out that oh. day. And, and, <laughs> a lot of, and a lot of smoke, if I remember, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. there were wildfires in Mexico. Right. Yeah, was all the smoke blown in. Yeah, we were in the conga line of, of chasers that yeah. day. Got caught yeah, behind it, a, it was, it was a chaser convergence. Train. Yeah, oh, oh, it was awful. Gosh. But That train is the bane of my existence <laughs> still. Now, you guys have been... Now, when you chase, do you chase like in the same vehicle? Because we've had a lot of chasers mm. who are like, no, I'm by myself or I have one person. What do you guys like to do? Yeah, ideally, we love to all three be in the car. Um, we think three is the perfect number. Um, and it just so happens that we get along. So if we, did, <laughs> if we didn't, it wouldn't work. Um, I know a lot of solo chasers have bad experiences with chasing with other people, but the three of us lucked out. We get along great. We have the same mindset chasing and we're, we're all equally just as bad at forecasting. So we all, <laughs> we all make mistakes going out. 
three and negatives no equal positive. I yeah. Think. yeah. We've actually taken personality tests before, uh, and we all like score exactly the same on this. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. We, How long have you guys have... known each other? Oh. Since like 2012, 2011 ish. Yeah. 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 But it like crazy, <laughs> like years and years after we started hanging out, we like took some personality tests and stuff like that. And we're like, uh, oh, holy crap. We are triplets, I guess. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's really crazy. So it works for us to be in the same vehicle for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you guys just hang out and start, did you chase and then decide, hey, we should chase together or sitting around drinking a beer and decide you're going to do this? Yeah, take it, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we were, uh, we, we, we met up, um, working together and we just found out that, Hey, you love chasing storms. I love chasing storms. And when you come across someone who loves storms, it's like, it's that rare kind of thing, you know, it's where mm-hmm. you find this like fraternity or sorority kind of where you find this commonality that's not normal. And so when, when we learned of our passions for storms and tornadoes, we immediately kind of glued together and, um, and we've tried to chase uh, together as much as possible. Uh, we're all in kind of different locations by and large. Jeremy's up in, in Colorado and then uh, I'm in Austin and, and Gabe is just about 30 minutes north of Austin. So um, we, we, uh, we spent time in the same place in Austin. Now we've kind of gone some separate ways. We try to link up as much as possible. Wow. So earlier you, you were mentioning the chaser convergence and all of that. Mm. I'm I'm horribly embarrassed to admit it's been about 10 years since I've had a good chase because that's what it's been about 10 years since I've lived out west. Chasing in New England isn't the same. Mm-hmm. How, how has it changed? How how has it evolved? What have you guys seen happen over the past 10 years? I feel like I may not recognize it. That's a good question. And honestly, we when Jeff said that we met and we knew we liked to chase, we hadn't really chased much up up to the point where we met in 2012 i think we said it was um so we i think that puts us as part of the problem when it comes to chaser convergence (laughs) we're adding to the numbers yeah it's us (laughs) um no it's it's uh we've definitely seen it grow i mean 2019 was the last really awful day that we got stuck in a long line it was miles long um i remember we came at a crossroads and we're waiting to pull out on the main road to get behind this tornado and we had to wait there for minutes and even then we just found a spot and pulled out really quickly but we could see as far as you could see it was cars chasing this tornado which event was that gabe the mangum texas oh that was the mangum Mangum on a high risk day and it was because it was a high risk day in oklahoma that's like the classic chase situation so everybody was out i believe it was on a weekend too which added added to it yeah it was a lot of factors that that equaled a lot of traffic um so it 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 is an issue um the later you chase in the season i'm giving away a secret so it's going to change now (laughs) the later you chase in the season um going into june and the further north you go especially into canada far fewer people yeah well you know you know why that is everybody has already spent all of their cash <laughs> yeah, they're on broke, chasing, right? yeah. chasing, chasing the vacation. March and April, yeah. uh, moderate and high risk storms in Dixie alley. Yeah. And, uh, you know, down it, no offense to you guys. Like I, I get, I, I, Austin's a great city, but oh. man, chasing in that area is the oh. worst. Yeah. Hard. It's not great. The hill it country. Is absolutely yeah. the worst. Yeah. Like I, uh, and, and flooding. I mean, I, a few times over the last few years, uh, you know, you, we get stuck by, um, you know, water crossing the road, turn around to go. The, oh, no, that's now filled in over there, too. And you're you're just stuck. Right. You can't have nowhere to go. Yeah, it's terrible. The, Super the, scary. The hill country here near Austin is it, we always say it's where storms come to die. So it's like it really is. You'll you'll get these huge squall lines or these discrete cells, either one. And they will find their way right to the hill country. And all of a sudden they just, they disappear. And then once they go past Austin and Gabe, you can attest to this. Uh, Gabe used to live on the other side of the main interstate, I-35, and they would just blow back up again. And so yep. Austin <laughs> just a kill zone. <laughs> you guys so what, sound what like every favorite? small town. You smell, you smell like, right. you sound like every small town person. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So so guys, tell me, each of you, what what is your favorite uh, favorite place to chase? Yeah, good. Hmm. Yeah, I would say for me, I've loved you know just the classic you know southern Oklahoma storms near near Red River, like. 
just so many great memories there and just great, great chasing territory. And um, yeah, so my heart is for sure in Southern Oklahoma. My, mine's in Kansas, just flat, green, and picturesque tornadoes, man. I just I love the Kansas landscape. I'd have to say Texas Panhandle. Um, up up until, and we mentioned this in our last episode we recorded, up until you hit the Caprock Canyon, and right. then it's a dead end and you can't go anywhere. But I love it for a couple of reasons. It's flat, it's open, you can see beautiful storms there, um, and it's closer to home. So I can sleep in my own bed that night. <laughs> hey, MG, nobody, nobody said Minnesota. That's ridiculous. No, Minnesota. I know. But <laughs> that was actually next. Tor tornado of the year the last. last year was. Well, in there were yeah. there's been some decent ones lately. Yeah. 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 And, and Phil, you, you saw that you Phil, you saw that uh, Scott Peak won that uh, storm photo of the year. I did. Yeah. With that, and that was that Ashby with that tornado. tornado. The Ashby yeah. one. Yeah. We're just, yeah. What a photo! What a photo! The footage is insane. The footage is great. Yeah. Yeah. So how how many people that you guys know were on that? I mean, there must have only been like four people, five people. That's what it seems. <laughs> I don't know yeah, anybody. I've, I've only see, actually I've only seen two uh, people with footage from that, so I can't imagine it was. I, yeah, I think there were three or four chasers on that one and Not scott also. basically the dream chase for yeah. those yeah. three yeah. guys <laughs> and scott is usually on those scott yeah, is, he is he's he's omnipresent i don't we don't understand <laughs> he's a wizard we call him the wizard he's, yeah, yeah I, I think i think there's a lot of chasers that um would love to just say that if they were being honest about it they would say their uh strategy would be just to follow scott peak around <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's yeah. our strategy that's uh, for sure <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of our biggest days, uh, the 2016 Winniewood Oklahoma tornado. We, we were following Scott that day. He, yeah. he, he let us ride in. Uh, it, it's amazing. In our footage, you see his little gold Honda. Like, and we're like, <laughs> no. follow that, follow that car. Yeah. Follow yeah. that car. Right on. So when, when was the last time all three of you got together for a chase? <sighs> it's Ooh. been a minute. It's been it's a been minute. a while, yeah. Was it it's 2018? Yeah. yeah, we, we met up in long, Kansas. Huh? Yeah. 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 It's been a while. Man, that's right. It's been it's been a hot minute. Really why crazy. why is that? Is it like I mean, obviously that's more than just COVID. You can't just blame COVID on that. Like, is it yeah. you know, families or you know, it's, work and both, all of all the above. All, all of the it, above. yeah. Yeah. Gabe Gabe and I are able to go more because we're both in the Austin, Texas area. So we can kind of link up. Jeremy's in Longmont, so just north of Denver, Colorado. And so trying to link up for storm chases is really difficult. What we'll try to do is play two different places. So if there's a risk in Oklahoma or Texas, Gabe and I'll try to hit that up. If there's a Nebraska, Colorado situation, then Jeremy will hit that up. So trying to trying to double double whammy it if we can. It's almost like Jeremy can get the cold, wintry side and yeah. you guys get the stormy, severe side. Exactly. Yeah, yeah he that's, can that's, he can have the we... cold. <laughs> <laughs> Jer Jeremy's the king of the land spouts. Yeah, yeah, truly. Yeah, yeah they're, they're yeah. amazing up there. Hoping for a good year this year with with land spouts. It's we've had a tiny little bit of a drought, but kind of everywhere has had a little bit of a drought over the last year. But mm -hmm. we'll see. Fingers crossed for this year. Because when you guys are out chasing, what's like the maybe the top one or two things you got to have with you? Ooh. because i saw your radar um radar tornado scene on a radar i think it had to be your voice jeremy right uh, i don't was know that's you? a good question was it a, was it a video it, it might have been just recently yeah uh, maybe. Probably Gabe's. yeah but i thought well one thing i love the side-by-side -side radar but i'm kind of curious what you guys go out with in the field you know a lot of people have radar scope and that kind of stuff but what do you guys like to have well, we're all kind of different, I think, in terms of what we pack. I'm trying lately to be more of like a, a drone guy, uh, I'm trying to dip my toe into that into that world. Um, and so I don't have as intense of rigs, camera rigs, as Gabe and Jeff do. Um, but yeah, and going back to, I think, Serena's question earlier of like what has like changed with weather. Um, chasing and storm chasing and things like that. I think if you if, if you have a smartphone, I mean, you can do it. Like you can track a storm, you can capture a storm. And so always, 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 you know, got to have your smartphone, got to have some signal too. That's the bane of our existence and probably the bane of yeah. a lot of chasers <laughs> existence. Um, 
but yeah, those are kind of, and then I just have, I don't have as intense of a video capturing, uh, digital camera, but I have kind of a, 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 sna a snapper. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to rock a drone, uh, these days and it that, differentiate, it, that, diversify that's changed everything. Drones have it's changed true. everything. And yeah. the drone footage is just so cool. Like when yeah. you see some yeah. of the stuff that's coming out, it's like that. Like last week. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have like, now I mean, within the past two years, like if you don't have a drone and you're chasing in the Southeast, then you, you're going to miss everything because mm -hmm. someone's going to have a drone and get the shot of the day, undoubtedly. Yep. And it's just mm -hmm. so much safer. You don't have to try to sneak up in between the trees up to this tornado. You just park your car and mm -hmm. fly up and you can see it coming miles away. That's uh, absolutely changing the game, um, especially in the Southeast. 100%. Yeah. Welcome to Outbreak. A new live stream format brought to you by the Stormfront Freaks podcast. Hosted by me, meteorologist Brady Harris, also known as Stormcat5. We'll go live on days of extreme weather with the goal of keeping you safe, informed, and entertained. The only question that remains is, are you ready for the Outbreak? All right, excellent. Hey, Andrew Blum is an author and journalist writing about technology, infrastructure, architecture, design, cities, art, travel. Man, you're into everything, aren't you? As a magazine journalist, he was published dozens of feature stories in publications, including Time, Wired, Popular Science, Vanity Fair, and The New York Times. His previous book, Tubes, A Journey to the Center of the Internet, was the first ever book-length look at the physical infrastructure of the internet. Now, his new book, The Weather Machine, A Journey Inside the Forecast, was published in June of this year, 2019. So welcome, Andrew. Thank what, you, everybody. What, what, okay, so what was it that sparked this idea to begin with? How did you even like, boom, this is a book I got to do? Uh, I mean, I was writing mostly about infrastructure. You know, I was kind of looking around, thinking about what, what you know, what the sort of range of big complex systems are. The sweet spot for me is things that we kind of all touch every day that are, you know, completely ubiquitous, but also are complicated enough that the barrier to entry is a little bit higher. Um, you know, I feel like those are the things that books can do better than magazine articles. Uh, and I also kind of knew that there's something that there's the the sort of tools of journalism can do different. Uh, from the people who are in this every single day. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, think about things like weather models. Uh, I felt like I could tell a story about weather models in a different way than the people who build them. But the real, the impetus, and this is how I, how I begin the book, but the impetus where it all kind of came together was with Hurricane Sandy. Um, so it's 2012. It's almost exactly seven years ago. And um, I, uh, I was just remember being completely shocked um, by the speed at which all of the meteorologists I followed on Twitter immediately freaked out uh, that Sunday afternoon, eight days before the storm. And um, it was confusing because it was clearly it, this wasn't about any kind of intuition. This wasn't about the sort of close look at the maps or any kind of analysis that was being done in a human way. Um, this was entirely uh, the output of the weather models. Um, and obviously that was an incredible model run uh, by the Euro sort of famous model run that Sunday afternoon, eight days before the storm hit New York. And I really just uh, couldn't, had not caught up with the fact that the weather models had gotten so good. And I had not caught up with the fact that um, that they'd become a kind of different kind of tool than than I, than, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what I thought they were. Um, and, um, you know, began to poke around and began to realize um, that, in fact, uh, these improvements had been relatively recent, um, that, in fact, there was a sort of sort of culmination of, you know, call it 100 years uh, of of work by meteorologists and this sort of, you know, confluence of all of these systems from supercomputers to satellites uh, and realized that I thought there was a, a, a book there, that there was a story to be told about how these how you know, how we'd gotten to the point we're at today. Uh, in meteorology, um, you know, driven so much by these technologies that are also a big part of our life and in, in many other forms. Now, were you, uh, real quick, I got to ask this, were you a, a history minor at all? Because the no. history in this, the storytelling, <laughs> I was intrigued by everything like, oh, that's where that came from. I yeah. honestly did not know a lot of that information. Jen probably did. 
Yeah, you know, this is true. This is true. Very true, <laughs> Naz. Um, Andrew, I'm just intrigued by, I mean, all the things that you've done and, and covered and, and written about where, like, what caused you to start? Like, tell us about your journey. You're like, okay, Hurricane Sandy, um, mm -hmm. and you didn't realize that, wow, the weather models have actually improved that significantly. So where did you start? Where were you like, okay, I got to go here. I got to do this. And then like kind of explain sort of your journey that you went on. Yeah, I um, I sort of puttered around with the idea for a while. And then uh, in January of 2014, um, I decided, or a little bit before that, in the fall of 2013, I decided that I it was time to get serious about this idea. And I went to um, AMS, to the American Meteorological Society Conference, which that year was in Atlanta. Uh, oh my God, I was there. Yep, yep. And uh, it was and it was amazing because, it, you know, it was, it was a chance to kind of wander the halls and go to a lot of sessions and pick out, um, you know, who, you know, who you know, find the interesting characters and interesting stories. And most remarkably, um, the kind of uh, weather journalist press corps, as much as it is, um, Jason Same now at the Washington Post, um, Guy, Guy Walton, um, uh, 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 Bob Henson, uh, kind of welcomed me in, you know, they never, you know, had just, just said, you know, join us for dinner, you know, come, you know, come hang out with us, you know, we'll kind of point you in the right directions. I just were incredibly generous um, in sort of sharing, uh, you know, sh sort of sharing their insights. And it was really from there that I met a lot of key people and began to kind of track the course of, of how I wanted to do this. The second piece of it was actually I was introduced to a guy named Robert Pincus, um, who's a uh, an atmospheric scientist. He's actually he lives in Brooklyn, but he's um his kind of institutional affiliation is at um at in Colorado, um and um and he kind of over a, a many lunches began to answer all my dumb questions. I kind of feel like as a journalist, you can come in dumb, but you're supposed to come out a little smarter. But coming in dumb's okay, uh, <laughs> and that like um. Uh, and that was, um, the, that, and then the next big step for me was I went to the, the wharf users workshop in Boulder that June. Nice. Um, and same thing, uh, you know, just, you know, a room full of experts. Um, and I would just go up to them at the coffee breaks and ask them a lot of questions. Um, and I had a, I had a short magazine article to work on. I kind of had an excuse to ask them a bunch of questions for, um, <laughs> for modern farmer magazine, which actually no longer exists. Um, but the, um, but it was, it was that, that kind of lay the groundwork, um, of beginning to sort of realize who the relatively small pool of people are, um, primarily in the weather modeling world. I wasn't going to sort of touch the broader meteorological world. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was, that was, it was a different thing than I was after, um, I kind of wanted to start at the narrow end of the funnel to see um, see what kind of stories I could tell from that. I love that. Oh, go ahead, Miss. I was going to say, you interviewed and met and spoke with a whole bunch of people. Who was your favorite? What, was it Thomas Jefferson? Uh, Thomas <laughs> Jefferson was a good interview. Yeah, he's a bit stuffy. Um, yeah. <laughs> actually, you know, it's not in the book, but I went, I went to... Um, I went to Philadelphia to see the room that he ostensibly wrote the Declaration of Independence in, just kind of you know, I really just kind of stuck, like took the commuter train one day and just said, like, what, what would it, what would it be like to try to describe the starting point of the story with American meteorology with Jefferson? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, it ended up on the cutting room floor, uh, but it was really, it, it was, um, you know, it, it was my, uh, my foolish attempt to actually try to interview Thomas Jefferson. So you joke, but, you know. No, it was good. <laughs> it was a dry, dry conversation. Sure. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So what, um, Andrew, explain to us some of the most surprising findings and most intriguing findings um, along this journey that would surprise like the everyday person, even, you know, a meteorologist that went to school for this. Yeah, um, I think, um, I mean, the the rate of improvement of the models never ceases to amaze me. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and yeah, we can talk about the Euro and the GFS and all that, but what we're really talking about when we talk about that is which one is getting better faster, you know, everything's getting better all at once. And, um, and it's tricky because, uh, for meteorologists and for the public, um, I think there's a kind of way of thinking about how well things work and what, what our expectations are. Um, and behind that, uh, we have this incredible improvement, you know, you know, every six months, you know, year by year. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, I, I love to put it, you know, you can put it in terms of the iPhone, you know, when the iPhone came out, the weather models weren't as good noticeably 
you know, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the Monday forecast for the weekend wasn't great. You know, the, you need the Tuesday forecast or the Wednesday forecast. You know, so 10 years later, um, you know, we've, we've really, we've picked up a day in a way that I, I kind of see in practice constantly. Um, and, um, and I think that, I mean, that, that's still, you know, I mean, again, we've had an amazing, uh, terrifying last, you know, six weeks or so, but yeah. with just so many of these examples, um, where the tools that we now have at our disposal to know what's coming, even if they can't, of course, change what's coming, um, have become really powerful. And, and I think that strangely, that's a surprise. That's a surprise to all of us. So, so you, what, you oh, oh, go ahead, Jen, keep going. So what do you think is the biggest thing that we have lacking um, in the meteorological world in, in forecasting? What is the biggest thing that we need to help us better um, to get forecasts a lot farther in advance and warnings and everything like that? Game show hosts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. <laughs> um, I think, well... I think there are two ways to think about that question. Actually, at first I thought you were asking sort of what's missing from the way we talk about the weather, what's missing from how we use the forecast. Um, and I think that's a really interesting conversation. But I guess the other way to answer that is really what do we need to make to you know to to technically make the forecast better, to make the models better, and all of that. Let me yeah. take the second part because I think it's a little bit easier. <laughs> Don't take it down a different road. Um, I'm amazed by. Um, uh, you know, I, in, in visiting the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, home of the Euro, and in talking to some of the different um, uh, satellite um, uh, experts and developers and things like that, it really sounds like the wind, up, the wind observing satellites are going to be a major breakthrough. Um, that seems to be the thing that they're most excited about. That's okay. you know, and, um, which is which 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 was surprising to me. Um, and then certainly uh, the microwave sounders over the last 10 years that have come into the polar orbiters, you know, not the geostationary satellites, not the GOES, which of course are the ones we kind of, you know, drool over mostly, um, you know, it's really the polar orbiters that are, have the data that can't be seen, you know, all the numerical data, the data that's kind of, you know, more useful for computers than for people um, that have been been driving so much of the improvement in the models, not, not you know, and we can talk about that, that distinction between the models and the forecasts. But the, um, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, um, that's pretty promising. I mean, it seems like, you know, we've got, you know, the rate of improvement is going to increase from, 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 from how I read it. So you, you might, so my question, Andrew, you talk, what, what's, what I like about the book is, so you talk about the history and you start with how, how did we get good at, um, forecasting weather starting mm -hmm. from, you know, the big advancement of the telegraph, for example, mm -hmm. Telegraph's um, a good technology. It's a to, yeah, of being <laughs> able to communicate yeah, yeah to other people of mm -hmm. what's coming, mm -hmm. right? But you also then you so you keep going down the line and you get into the, you talk about the ghost satellites and the you talk about uh, the the data that these models are getting. So through my, my question is how what do you feel through all these advancements? And and obviously there's just like technology, it's the, the advancements now happen so much faster than the advancements, you know, did a uh, hundred years ago to even a decade ago. Mm -hmm. What what did you feel through all that research? What was what do you think was the biggest advancement so far in weather forecasting? What was it? I, I mean, it's really the satellite era. I mean, that's really that's really the thing. And I don't, I don't think I realized that when I started. You know, I, I thought satellites were one piece of the observing system, and I mean, they are one piece of the observing system. But the ability to uh, to get a picture of the entire Earth, and that's not just a sort of technical thing. Um, it's almost more of a philosophical thing. You know, this sort of getting accustomed as humans to looking looking down on the Earth rather than only looking up at the sky um, has been such a defining change for for, for everything, you know, I mean that not just the kind of blue marble picture of the earth, but the actual technical ability for, for, for satellites to, 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 to measure the entire atmosphere as a step importantly for a global atmospheric model, you know, that's the key tool that's giving us longer range forecasts. And, you know, my bias in the book and kind of my, my sort of interest is in this sort of medium and longer range, you know, that, that kind of seeing into the future, I, I find, um, uh, you know, it's kind of my East Coast bias, I think, you know, I'm, you know, it's, it's more, it's more about the, you know, the snowstorm coming five days than it is about the, um, the, the front coming in three hours. Um, but the, uh, but yeah, I think, I mean, that, that ability to have an entire picture of the globe as a tool towards getting, towards stepping farther back and or forward in time uh, for longer range forecasts is really, I think, what, 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 what's the crux of it for me. I love that. So, um, 
just thinking about the international like alliance that we have, because I know I believe it was the 1900 uh, hurricane uh, that hit Texas and we weren't really talking well with um, the meteorologists in Cuba. We didn't get, you know, accurate information. Um, there wasn't a lot of communication. And so um, we were kind of caught off guard with that. I know there's more of a story to that. But when thinking of, OK, you know, sometimes, you know, countries, you know, politically, we, we don't get along. Is there a weakness somewhere that you're concerned of um, kind of? going through this research and everything that could potentially hurt or hinder our growth um, in, in the golden age of meteorology, as you say. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I, I think that at the moment, we've got a lot of momentum. Um, we've got a really mature global system of exchanging weather observations um, where we've got a really mature system of, of those observations being pulled into the global weather models and then being distributed back out to the world. Um, I think that there is the risk that we kind of take that friendly and constant and and sort of very carefully calibrated exchange of global data for granted. Um, and I think, you know, one of the risks, and it's not happening yet, but you kind of can begin to see the seams of it, um, is with a shift towards towards private satellites and private uh, observations of different kinds, whether, you know, from car sensors or smartphones or things like that. Um, where uh, and you see this really clearly, you know, the, the private satellite companies now, companies like Spire, um, you know, they uh, they they want to be able to sell their data more than once. Um, and according to the current rules of the road uh, for how weather data is exchanged globally among weather services around the world, um, that doesn't work. Uh, and um, you know, if if we if if NOAA insisted that no, they're not going to share that data. Um, and the Europeans said, well, then we're not going to share our data back. Um, you know, there, the potential for this 150 year old system to fragment, um, and you don't have that global weather exchange, the global exchange of data uh, is very, is, is there. Um, and we'd all last about two days, you know, we, you know, we, we, that, that would be that, um, you know, that everything, the whole, whole system would fall apart. You would, you, you know, you could, there'd be some inertia in the system for a couple more days and then there would be no more, no more, no more five day forecast. That would be it. So it's I, I think it's I, it hasn't happened yet, um, but there are certainly some trends that point towards it um, if we're not careful with what we have. Thank you for tuning in to the Stormfront Freaks podcast. You can watch our bi-weekly show live on youtube.com slash stormfrontfreaks and download the audio version on your favorite podcast player. For links to our Patreon team of exclusive benefits, show notes, past shows, new videos, merchandise, and more, visit our website at stormfrontfreaks.com. While you're there, check out our interactive chaser radar from our friends at zoomradar.com. If you'd like to contact us with questions or make comments about the show, shoot us an email to questions at stormfrontfreaks.com or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Search for Stormfront Freaks. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time and tell a friend about the Stormfront Freaks podcast.